All right. Hello, Reggie. How are you? Hi, Glenn. I'm fine. This is uh, Glenn Lowry at the Glenn Show, TV. And I'm talking today with Rajiv Seti, professor of economics at Barnard College, uh, Columbia University in the city of New York. Uh, I am a professor here of economics at Brown University. And uh, Rajiv is an old friend and a frequent uh, uh, dialogue partner here at Blogging Heads with me. And one of the subjects that we've taken up over the uh, last many months is uh, the question of uh, police citizen interactions and the use of lethal force. And uh, we want to spend our time today, if I can just take a moment to introduce our conversation, uh, to talk about uh, the case of Philando Castile and Diamond Reynolds. Now, uh, the audience might recall that Philando Castile was the African-American man who was shot to death by a police officer in Falcon Heights, Minnesota, after a traffic stop. Uh, he was armed, Castile was had a permit to carry the weapon and was attempting to communicate with the officer to that effect when the officer, in what would appear to be a moment of panic uh, and fear, uh, shot Castile several times through the window of the automobile while his girlfriend, sat uh, Diamond Reynolds, sat in the seat next to him and her daughter sat in the back seat. A very famous case, a uh, notorious case that got na nationwide attention the officer was charged with uh, manslaughter, if I'm not mistaken, and was acquitted uh, recently uh, by a jury. Uh, and I'll end this introduction simply by observing that after that acquittal, I became very interested in trying to look into the details of the case. How could the jury have come to that decision, I wonder? And as a part of that inquiry, um, I happened to cross uh, at YouTube a video recording of um, Diamond Reynolds being interviewed by police officers immediately after this event, at a point when it was not even known what the ultimate fate of Philando Castile would be. When the interview began, they didn't know whether or not he had survived. Of course, in the end, he did not survive. And I was really taken by this uh, interview by Diamond Reynolds, uh, as was Rajiv, and we decided we would make that the subject of the conversation. Rajiv, do you want to uh, say, sort of weigh in here and, and, and give some of your thoughts and, and reactions uh, to this interview? We can get into the meat of why it is we think it's worth talking about here at Blogging Hits. Yeah, it's a fascinating interview. As you said, it's on the night of the, the shooting. Um, she finds out in the middle of the interview that she hasn't survived it. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really riveting. It's hard to watch. Uh, it covers a lot of ground, including um, uh, marijuana possession, um, you know, firearms, uh, uh, the kind of neighborhood she was living in, her jobs, uh, two jobs that she held, one in the day, one at night, Castile's role in her life, and so on and so forth. It's just, it, it, you know, it's uh, it's very absorbing, very very interesting, uh, very emotional, as you put it, and and and. Um, I think uh, we can learn something from discussing it. That's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good topic for us to take up on this show. I, I, was, I was really struck by this interview. Um, she comes off, uh, to my mind, as a very sophisticated, highly intelligent, articulate woman. Um, she is, now you have to recall, um, in police custody, not that she's been charged with anything, but uh, she's been taken into custody for interrogation in a officer-involved shooting. And her man, her husband, in effect, they are not legally married, but they've been together for an extended period of time and have a very close relationship, about which we'll talk more, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, has been uh, shot multiple times and is probably, she has to imagine, dying at this moment. Uh, she's being asked about the circumstances of the event, and she is interjecting her observations and thoughts about, about how police are conducting themselves, about what the political ramifications of this will be, and so on. Um, she presents herself in, in such an um, effective way, uh, and perhaps I should, you know, uh, be a, a little bit critical of myself for being surprised at how intelligent, articulate, uh, savvy, uh, self-possessed, 
uh, uh, level-headed uh, she was in the interview. Uh, but I just have to wonder whether I <laughs> would have been uh, equally uh, uh, in command of my faculties and uh, able to conduct myself in such a manner. She was not in a panic in, in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it just raised in my mind a lot of questions about the uh, uh, stereotypes that at least some Americans harbor about the people who are uh, in these situations, by which I mean people of color, uh, modest or low-income people, people living in high-crime areas of cities, uh, uh, people who are uh, coming into contact with law enforcement in one way or another, perhaps through no uh, fault of their own, but nevertheless given the situation, and who are the subjects of the uh, depredations that are being criticized by uh, movements like Black Lives Matter and others, uh, who are these people? Uh, well, you know, they're not so very different from you and I. Again, perhaps that didn't need to be said, but it, I think uh, it certainly uh, oh, wants to be said here. Perhaps it should have already been presumed so, but I doubt that it is. Um, and her analysis, I mean, she was analytical in her cast of mind. Anyway, I'm talking too much and I want to stop. I just, I'm just laying on the table some of the uh, uh, features of that uh, discussion that motivated me to pass it along to you and, and uh, urge us to talk about it here publicly. Absolutely. I agree. It, she, she doesn't fit a, uh, any stereotype. But also, also what struck me from that interview is that uh, she paints a fairly detailed picture of Philando Castile, who also doesn't fit any stereotype uh, uh, of a male, you know, in, in that environment, in that situation. And it's so, so both those facts, I think, make this, uh, uh, you know, uh, an extraordinary video to watch. Um, the implicit description of Philando Castillo, who, who comes across as being utterly remarkable, I, I have to say. Um, and, and she's also extremely credible. So when she describes the shooting itself, which she's asked to do on several occasions, and, um, it's, you know, there are slight variations in, in the manner of uh, uh, conveying the account, but it, they're completely consistent and, and really you know, heartbreaking in any way. Um, it was just a, you know, it's just a sort of extraordinary moment of panic, as you put it, which appears to be, has been, you know, really quite unwarranted. I mean, if you think about the, the situation, actually, you've got somebody in a vehicle, um, you know, ostensibly stopped for a broken tail light, but, but uh, uh, perhaps because he fit the description of a robbery suspect, uh, but you know, it, uh, you know, it's it's an environment in which there's a four-year-old child in the back who um, uh, who sort of lets herself out of uh, her, her seatbelt. Um, there's a there's a couple uh, um, sitting in the front seat. This this doesn't come across as a typical robbery getaway to me. You know, so it's just it's just uh, an amazing thing. And and she describes this in uh, very precise, very consistent terms throughout that interview. But the very first thing, if you recall, that she says when she enters the room, she, uh, she says that she had uh, made accusations against the officer of being racist. And for that reason, they appear to have sent in uh, 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 a black interviewer in addition to the white interviewer, uh, which, of course, uh, uh, he denies and, and you know, probably quite correctly denies. But, but that's her first instinct, actually, is to observe that she's being interviewed here by one white and one uh, 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 black official. And she makes a point of uh, 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 observing that, that, that this is probably as a result of her accusations about racism. So that's where it starts. And, and you're right. And it's analytical all the way through. Yeah. The visual effect of, of that uh, uh, sort of staging, uh, the room is very stark. Uh, the yeah. interrogation room. Uh, I imagine where uh, a camera that she may or may not be aware of is recording the event. Uh, there are the two officers, as you say, one white and one black. Uh, they look like they came right out of central casting wearing, you know, <laughs> bad suits or, uh, <laughs> you know, ill-fitting, whatever. Uh, they're jolly and they're, they're uh, middle-aged and they're, they, you know, they're nothing but the facts, ma'am, Jack Webb kind of... Uh, uh, cops uh, who have their questions to ask. They've done this a million times before. Uh, one white and one black, as you say. And, yeah. and the, the black guy doesn't do much of the talking, but he does chime no. in every now and then. Right. 
to uh, uh, to play uh, his designated role in in the whole affair. Uh, and here is this uh, young African American woman who has just been victimized horribly. Um, and uh, there's all of the, the latent kind of well, maybe he was engaged in some kind of criminal activity. Yes, marijuana was found in the vehicle, and. Uh, so on, and she uh, uh, proceeds to testify about who this guy who had just been shot shot to death as it would happen right. um, uh, actually was uh, about how long ten years he had been working for the public schools of Minneapolis, right. about how he was such a good although they were not legally married, and he was not the father of her child, uh, he had been such a good uh, partner and support for her. Uh, caring for the child. She was working two full-time jobs, this woman, yeah. and someone had to make sure that the kid got uh, uh, taken where it needed to go, got uh, the dinner that it needed to get, got read to before yeah. it went to sleep at night, and so on, and Philando Castile was that guy. They'd been together off and on, mostly on, for 10 years. Um, uh, he had no record. Uh, he had... Uh, uh, a permit to carry the weapon that he was carrying. This guy's death was an absolute tragedy. I mean, it was this yeah. was a good man by any account, notwithstanding the fact that he spoke uh, a uh, ghetto dialect of the English language, and uh, most likely, notwithstanding the fact that he was a young African American man, notwithstanding the fact that he liked to smoke a little marijuana from time to time. A lot of people do, I'm told. Um, uh, his death. Uh, was a tragedy. Again, I am probably just stating the obvious, but uh, yeah. if anybody can find this video, just go to YouTube and search. Yeah. I, I suspect that I suspect that her life must have really fallen apart. And there's no way she could have held down those two jobs. So she had a job at the embassy suites in the daytime, and then she went to, I think it was family dollar after that. He would take her from one job to another. He would read to the child at night. Um, the little girl was born. She was four years old. She, you know, she was born during an interruption of a 10-year relationship between Castile and Diamond Re uh, Reynolds, um, she was, you know, she was very open about that. But the way in which he took care of this child, um, the way in which he shuttled her from one job to another, held down his own full-time job, um, did errands for her sister, you know, driving her sister. They had just come from dropping her sister off somewhere. Uh, you know, it just, it just seemed like, uh, it seemed to me like her life must have, must have really fallen apart. Quite apart from the emotional toll that the death would have taken, um, there's, you know, it just seems inconceivable to me that she could take care of a child, hold on two jobs, and just, just find the physical energy and the time to do what she was previously doing um, when she was uh, supported, you know, by Castile, when they were supporting each other, in, uh, in effect. But it's, what's interesting, Glenn, is the conversation, the way in which she discusses marijuana, and the way in which she discusses guns, is, is completely fascinating. I think we should spend a little bit of time. Completely, she's completely not defensive. Um, you know, they, they talk about the fact that there was marijuana found in the vehicle. And, and she's completely open about it. And she says, yes, we like to smoke. There are doctors, there are smokers. There are doctors, there are doctors and lawyers who are smokers. So what? So what? You know, it's really... It's really extraordinary. There is no, there is no, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, reluctance to, to, to admit to something that is, you know, quite clearly illegal at this time. Uh, uh, whether it should be or not, you know, we can debate. But she's not defensive about it. She's not trying to hide it at all. Which, to me, makes the testimony about the killing itself much, that much more credible. I think one of her jobs brought her into contact with lawyers or doctors, I don't remember which, but with a, a group of professionals, and she was there to report that a lot of the people that she works with who That's have it. these uh, doctorate degrees or these law degrees smoke. Which you is know, true. Which is absolutely um, true. In, yeah. in other words, you're finding that marijuana in my car does not in any way discredit me. There is no That's way that it could possibly legitimate that officer behaving in the way in which he did. Uh, it may be technically against the law, but it's a law that's honored mostly in the breach around here yeah. these days. And, uh, you know, I'm not on the defensive because you found marijuana in my car. I, I, I really admired that. I thought <laughs> not, it was fantastic. Not yeah. mainly because I might smoke marijuana or I might not. I'm not confessing to anything. But because yeah. her dignity Absolutely. was not compromised in the least. 
absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's what I meant by saying she wasn't defensive, but that, that's absolutely right. She was completely, uh, yeah, it was, it was a phenomenally interesting response. I, I think, you know, and a, and a lovely response in some ways. Um, but even more interesting, I would say, was the discussion of guns. Um, why, he, why he had a firearm. Um, you know, and the fact that he took her to a driving range, that he had her rent a weapon, uh, um, you know, to develop proficiency in the use of uh, firearms. The fact that two people had been killed in, in her backyard, um, uh, she mentioned, that he was really making sure that she and that he and she and the child were, in a sense, protected. Now, we can argue about the wisdom of uh, of getting a, 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 you know getting a license, securing a firearm, uh, going to a range and training with it um, as a response to that situation, but it's certainly understandable and, and and it's very very logical the way in which she describes it. It's again like I said, it just shatters a whole lot of stereotypes. This is the kind of behavior that uh, uh, that the NRA actually extols. Uh, you know, weapons for self-defense, going to a range, being proficient in their use. Uh, you know, uh, it's just, you know, this is one of the, it's been, this has been observed many times, but it's shocking that the NRA has not jumped to the defense of this. Well, you know, he, he should be a poster boy for he the should. NRA. <laughs> he, is he, a, he is a law-abiding citizen, let's put That's the marijuana on the side, who has armed himself for self-defense, which is exactly what the NRA argues, who has had his life taken uh, not right. the, uh, by a police officer who, in effect, uh, uh, you know, negated his right to bear arms and to defend himself. Yeah, I just, I can't, you know, I can't make sense of uh, the, the failure of the gun rights uh, uh, folks to defend this person other than, other than to count on uh, race, I mean, other than, other than the... Interrupting, but a hypothesis suggests itself. Okay, yes, which yes, is that exactly. the latent demand for for firearms for self protection for many of the uh, devotees of the National Rifle Association derives from their fear of quote black crime close quote. Right. Right. Now here is a quote black criminal close quote or proto criminal or potential criminal or looks like a criminal. Right. He's not a poster boy for our movement because he's the guy that we're arming ourselves against, and if not him, then his cousin or his brother. Yeah, yeah. I no, no. I, I, I see that. Of course, I, I was, uh, you know, um, what I meant was I, I couldn't see any sort of legitimate or, or consistent or intellectually honest reason for them to fail to defend. Yes, yes. But what you're pointing out is, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that one hundred. Were smart. Um, yeah. They might have uh, seized upon this as an opportunity to make uh, further inroads into a. A potential constituency, which are people living in high crime areas of uh, central cities who are uh, victimized by uh, the criminals there. I mean, uh, there are high homicide rates or rising homicide rates in lots of American central cities. It's been getting a, a much of attention, uh, much attention in the recent years. And uh, those are yeah. largely black, black and Latino areas. And uh, uh, these are Americans who <laughs> need to be protected from violent criminals. Some of whom yeah. want to take matters into their own hands. Again, you, as you say, you can question the wisdom of that, but yeah. uh, the 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 sort of uh, intuition that that's a way in which a number of people are going to want to respond is is pretty compelling to me. It seems like the NRA might have might have picked up on that. Yeah, and and the logic is uh, you know the, the logic that is used to defend uh, um, you know firearms possession, training, etc. is precisely. Uh, um, and very effectively communicated by Diamond Reynolds in this uh, in this interview, uh, she makes the case uh, basically implicitly. I mean, it's not you know, she, you know a lot of the conversation. Uh, really, the, the 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 most interesting aspects of it come out uh, you know through digressions and so on. So she you know she you know these are digressions in the conversation, which is really about what transpired uh, on on that particular day. But. Uh, but she's very, very precise, very effective in communicating this rationale for this. You know, um, why should he have been? Going to be big turmoil about this. You know, this is going to be in the news all over the country. I mean, she's okay. she's very keenly aware. Okay. Indeed, I suppose we shouldn't be as surprised by that in view of the fact that she had the uh, presence of mind to pull out her phone and begin uh, video recording uh, the scene 
Yeah. Almost uh, uh, immediately after uh, Philando Castile was shot uh, by the police officers. And I'm, I'm, again, well, that's not something I'm sure I would have thought to do. Well, let me let me speak to that a little bit. So I'm sure that you know when this recording between the two of us goes live, um, uh, a few people are going to respond with various other videos of of Diamond Reynolds that are out there online, as they did you know, in response to your Facebook post. And, and uh, in fact, she was a frequent user, as uh, uh, as many people are, of Facebook Live. So she would post videos live of herself, uh, um, you know, partying or performing. And you know, these are performance videos in some sense. And and uh, there's one in particular that uh, you know, where she and Castile presumably are are uh, listening to music, smoking weed, listening, you know. Uh, uh, in, on, on the 4th of July, it seems to me, you know, with fireworks going off around them. And this little uh, uh, yes. shorts and whatever, and she shows right. her body off as she smokes the marijuana and uh, right. laughs into the camera. Yeah, and performs, and she's, you know, singing to the, the you know, she's rapping along with the, with the, with the music. Um, so, so this was a, a, a more uh, automatic reaction for her. Than it would be for you and you and I. Uh, you know, we use Facebook. I hardly, I hardly ever do. But but I, we use it in a different way. Um, you know, posting live uh, videos of oneself is uh, is something. If one does it routinely, then it makes uh, uh, then it's more then it's understandable why it may have happened in this situation. She just thought to do it right away. Um, so I, I think those two things are linked. Uh, I, I you know we should also at some point I think speak to whether or not these other videos that are out there, and in, and in fact, her arrest for aggravated assault, which also has been, has been mentioned, was mentioned when you posted the, the interrogation video on, on Facebook, you know, whether these things are actually relevant to um, the way in which we interpret uh, the interrogation itself or, or, or the broader case. Um, I have a few thoughts on that, but, but, but you know, we can, we can do that uh, later if you like. I was going to speak to that in, in a sense because I think it's pertinent uh, to this uh, larger issue of although her style of self-presentation, her cultural orientations and so forth may be of the sort that one would associate with a somewhat seamy or underside of inner city life, nevertheless, here was an upstanding woman, here was an intelligent and articulate woman, here was a rightly uh, aggrieved uh, and uh, uh, a victimized woman uh, who was able to keep her head and 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 um, uh, react under pressure in an extraordinary way, and that's worth noting. And, and, right. and it, to me, that's all the more worth noting in view of the fact that she turns out not to be, um, you know, uh, a uh, uh, sort of. Uh, picture perfect middle american right. uh, innocent okay right. Uh, right. she's a little uh, risque she's got a little bit of an edge to her you know and uh, i don't know the facts of this uh, 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 assault charge and i'm not making any brief uh, for diamond reynolds uh, in that respect I i'm simply saying though that that does not in any way it seems to me detract from the uh, quality of her uh, uh, reaction to that uh, to that stressful situation. Uh, yes, I agree with that completely. I, uh, um, although, yeah, I agree that, and, and also it should be mentioned that she's uh, she's entered a plea of not guilty to the assault charge um, and claims that uh, claims that uh, you know cell phone evidence puts her at uh, a different location. So. So we'll see. We'll see what comes of that. But I, the reason I mentioned it is because uh, you sent me a link. Actually, the, the link I believe is in the comments to your Facebook post on this uh, on this issue. But the, the link itself describes uh, uh, somebody who's very concerned that this charge um, would have a bearing on the case. Now, this was before the officer himself was uh, acquitted of manslaughter. But uh, but uh, but the point of view taken in the video was that that this could affect the outcome, uh, whether it did or not. I don't know. I understand. I actually haven't got firsthand knowledge of this. This is something someone told me who might be more familiar with the case. That her performance in the courtroom yeah. turned out not to be entirely credible. That she contradicted herself in uh, under cross examination. This was exposed to the jury. 
And so not so much the fact that she had an outstanding uh, charge for assault as the fact that she simply wasn't a very uh, good witness and perhaps because she wasn't uh, entirely uh, consistent in the set of things that she had been saying, having been interviewed several times uh, prior to the trial. Yeah. Uh, but the jury acquitted this police officer yeah. of the manslaughter charge. What are, what are we to make of that? Well, uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, it's very difficult to get a conviction if an officer can credibly argue that he was uh, he was in fear, even if even if not everyone in that situation would have been in fear, um, you know, even if one might think that he really ought not to have been in fear, um, given you know, given the fact that there's a four-year-old child in the back, this is not the robbery suspect that you're looking for. Um, it's very, very hard to get, uh, you know, to get a conviction um, under those circumstances. The legal standard is such that uh, as long as, my, my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, of course, but, I, you know, my understanding is that, you know, as long as there is a, you know, there is a credible communication that, that he was actually in fear. I think the standard is that a reasonable uh, person would have uh, feared for their lives under, that, under the circumstance. Um, well, look, uh, you know, in my view, in my view, a reasonable person really ought not to have. But, you know, uh, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, uh, you see, this, what one case, I mean, it's worth thinking about this other case that's, that happened in uh, September 2014 in South Carolina. And that was the shooting of uh, LeVar Jones. He, he was uh, uh, a gentleman who had just uh, stepped into a white pickup van after work, uh, uh, and, and yeah, and he he just uh, drove into a gas station, just drove around the corner without a seatbelt, uh, you know, into a gas station was uh, you know was stopped by a by an officer, asked to get his license and registration. He reached back into the vehicle to get that, and was immediately shot uh, several times. Uh, he survived that, you know, and that video is online. That, that that's a high quality video in the sense that the the events. Unlike the Castile case, where where the video only captures the aftermath of the shooting, this is a video that that uh, that captures the shooting itself and and, and the build up to it. And uh, it's interesting. In that situation, the officer was uh, dismissed, uh, and in fact, I believe that he pled guilty in the end um, to some fairly serious charges. And the the statement dismissing him from the South Carolina Department of Public Safety said that uh, um, he perceived uh, uh, a threat when there was none. I'm paraphrasing here. I, I wrote about this on my blog, I think, uh, under the title, Threats Perceived When There Are None. And so, so that was a case in which it was judged. Um, the officer, it did not appear to me, had any malice towards this person, but, but uh, clearly was fearful when there was really no justification for it. Started shooting, uh, he was hit, LeVar Jones was hit in the hip, he survived that. Um, but uh, but of course was 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 badly hurt um, and in that case in that case the fear defense obviously was not enough uh, being fearful is not enough you're right uh, you know you have to you have to be justifiably fearful I, I imagine and so in this case uh, yeah I, I described it in the interview his uh uh, weapon was in the side pocket. His wallet was in the back pocket. The wallet is bulky yeah. and difficult to remove from the pocket because, as she says, and it's almost a little humorous, yeah, she doesn't true. understand why, but he just wants to put everything in that wallet. Okay, yeah, so his right. gun license is in that wallet, yeah. and Lord knows what else is in that wallet. The wallet yeah. is overstuffed, and it's difficult to get out. The gun is bulging in his side pocket, and it's in a holster. He's yeah. trying to reach behind himself with his left hand, I assume, to get the wallet out of his back pocket so he can show the officer his license and registration or his uh, license to carry or both. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, his hand has to go past the weapon, which is bulging in the side pocket, in order to do that. And he's already notified the officer that he has a weapon uh, in yeah. his possession, which he's licensed to carry. The officer apparently yeah. uh, at some point panics or becomes especially uh, alarmed and begins shouting commands at him to not go for the weapon, not go for the weapon. Of course, he's not going for the weapon. 
He's going for his wallet in his back pocket, which is difficult to remove, but which he needs to remove in order to respond to the officer's prior command to present his documentation. Yeah, and it's in that yeah. setting that the officer starts starts shooting. Yeah, it's it, actually it's important to note that all of this happens uh, uh, um, in a flash. I mean, yeah. uh, the way that she describes it is is that he asks for it and he declares that he has a. a yeah, he's trying to reach for his wallet. He's trying, having difficulty, as you said. I, you know, the gun is holstered, and I, I don't know if it's in his pocket or in his belt, or but it's in the way. It's concealed. There's absolutely she's adamant that he cannot view the uh, weapon, that the officer cannot view the weapon, and um, and he's having troubles. And he tells the officer that he he has a, a weapon, um, and the way Simon Reynolds tells it in this interrogation is that the officer can respond by saying. Um, you know, don't move, bam, bam, bam. I mean, it's it's instant. It's 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 you know, it's prior. You know, you know, it, it would be impossible to respond to the command before the gunshots come. Uh, it seems to me the way that she described it's just it's just instantaneous almost. Um, that the command for him, he, he's previously asked for his license and registration. Now he's asked not to move, but he's shot before he can even you know really process what he's been told he should do. Um, and the whole thing is just really, really, really terrible, I think. It's just terrible. I just don't... It, it does not appear... So let me put it this way. It, it, it appears to me that, you know, the presence of a firearm, the appearance of Fernando Castillo, perhaps the description of uh, some robbery suspect that he was told about, yeah. become vastly more salient then the four-year-old child in the back, yeah, and the passenger, they are almost invisible. You know, and and this phenomenon is uh, is, is really okay. very interesting, it seems to me. So let's try to look at it from the cop's point of view, which I assume is what this jury of twelve people, including two African Americans, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a jury that came unanimously to the conclusion that the officer should not be found guilty. And I assume that they would, too, have to try to put themselves in the officer's position. Yeah. So, um, does he or does he not resemble the robbery suspect? Maybe all that he knew about the robbery suspect was that he was black, uh, you know, a young man of a roughly age range and of a roughly body type, and, uh, right. you know... Uh, so he thinks he might be dealing with someone who's a criminal. Uh, he's been told that the person is armed. He smells marijuana in the car, or so he alleges, and marijuana was later found in the car. And he um, is giving commands that he feels, it perceives, are not being, um, not being responded to. Uh, and he is in fear of his life. Uh, is it unreasonable to imagine that, I don't know, if you or I were in that situation, this is a very dangerous situation for a police officer pulling a vehicle over at night uh, in, in uh, uh, a, a place where he might have reason to think that the criminal activity is ongoing. Uh, he's stereotyping for sure. If he, mm. it's an older white woman, he's probably not afraid. Even if she tells him that she has a weapon, he's probably not afraid in the same way. Why don't the uh, female passenger and the child in the back uh, allay his fears? Uh, I, I, I can't answer that. It does seem to me that they ought at least to have dialed them down a bit. Um, you know, uh, but uh, that jury, in coming to the not guilty conclusion that they came to, uh, basically have endorsed, at least from their point of view, the reasonableness of the officer's behavior under the circumstance. Uh, yes. Which makes me want to think of this as a, as you know, people say he murdered him. I, well, I, I almost want to say this was just a tragic, uh, we should be thinking about how to prevent these tragedies for sure, in terms of the training of officers and all of that. Uh, but this is just a kind of uh, tragic and, and terrible uh, calamity that uh, befell uh, Castile and, and Diamond Reynolds. Uh, mm -hmm. Not necessarily a manifestation of some, you know, uh, uh, what did Castile's mother is quoted in something as saying, uh, that we are hunted, we are being hunted. 
you know, I, I so I, <laughs> and people who've been following me here at Blogging Heads know that I, I've been a little bit reluctant to jump on the bandwagon about the, you know, the police are a, a racist uh, uh, occupying force in black communities who are hunting down our people. I, I think the, the situation. No. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. You know, there there are two folks um, following this case who said that Philando Castile uh, would not have been dead if he had been white. One was the governor of Minnesota, Mark Dayton. You got a lot of grief for that. Sure, it's plausible. Uh, it's a and, very plausible claim. And and the other actually was a, a guest on your show. Um, uh, Peter Moscos, to yeah. form of all the police officer, uh, and, and I believe who is who is quite credible on these matters. I, I, I find his blog, you know, very informative and and, and fair. Uh, uh, actually, he doesn't always uh, stand by stand by the police story. In Let me situation. just tell people that's Peter Moscos, M O S K O S, of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City, whose right. blog. Cop in the Hood is an extremely informative uh, source of uh, data and observations about policing in inner city communities. He's a former Baltimore City police officer himself. And, uh, and a sociologist, I believe, by, by training, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know yeah. what they call the degree when you serve for a year on the streets of Baltimore as a beat cop, but it's certainly an education. That's right. And, and so both of these folks, uh, Mark Dayton and uh, Rita Moscos, uh, claimed that Castile uh, would not have been dead had, uh, had he been white. Now, let's try to think uh, about that from the perspective of the jury. Is it, is it, is it reasonable uh, to fear um, other things equal? Now, I know that you know, other things are never always equal, but you know, four-year-old child in the back, there's a, a young woman in the passenger seat. You smell marijuana, let's say. The person matches a robbery suspect, and and you know about you know about uh, I don't know 40 to 45 percent of robberies in the in the United States by victim surveys have white offenders. So it's uh, it's common, right? A, a, a white male robbery suspect. Um, uh, you know, in, imagine the the situation. You know, being the same except for the race of uh, a driver, passenger, and child. If Dayton and Moscos are right uh, uh, in saying that things would have transpired very differently, uh, given that they had the gun, given that there's difficulty reaching the wallet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then in what sense is the fear reasonable? I, I this is a this is a tough question. I mean, I I, I think that. I wonder, I'm just asking, I'm just wondering whether the jury... Well, it seems to me this is really a question about when is racial... I mean, you're starting with the premise, taking it for granted, and I'm not disputing it, that uh, if Castile had been white, he'd be alive today. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that if the jury believed that, suppose that the jury believed that. Believed, okay, uh, I just want to yeah. make my point. Suppose the jury believed that Castile being black contributed materially to him being dead. Yes. How, and that, how could and they that, nevertheless yes. acquit the officer? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, uh, and can one, can one, yeah, can one, so uh, let me just pose the question and then, can one simultaneously believe that Castile would have been alive had he been white and that the officer acted reasonably? Yeah, yeah, that's my question. That that's equivalent to asking, is it ever reasonable to racially profile? To, to have one's estimate, even if only implicit, of the character of the danger that one faces, being a police officer pulling a, a vehicle over, influenced by racial information. Is that reason? It seems to me that those are equivalent yeah. questions. Uh, he was more afraid, I think, we speculate, of course, but because uh, it's a counterfactual, but it's not unreasonable speculation. He was more afraid in that situation with a black person behind the wheel of the vehicle than he would have been had there been a white person behind the wheel of the vehicle. The jury mm -hmm. well might believe that. I think I believe it. So now, is that inconsistent with reason, with him being reasonable? And uh, I'm imagining him making a calculation, if not consciously, then, you know, in the back of his mind that um, the... Uh, 
uh, rate of uh, violent crime in uh, this community uh, is uh, considerably higher among blacks than it is among whites. So the conditional probability that this person is a bad actor, uh, given that he's black, is a higher number than it would be given that he's white, just based upon some kind of statistical calculation. And so I've got a threshold. I behave in a threshold manner. If the probability that the person is a bad actor gets above a certain level, that triggers my uh, more aggressive response. And uh, that level is below the estimate if the person is black, but above the estimate if the person is white. Some yeah. kind of decision theoretic uh, reasoning of that sort. And right. I don't see anything unreasonable in that. It may be immoral. It, yeah. it may be wrong to reason in such a way, but it doesn't yeah. obviously strike me as illogical or irrational to reason. Uh, right, that's right. And yet, and yet our laws uh, don't allow, uh, really, or disallow that kind of reasoning in, in, in various circumstances, right? The idea that you must have probable cause uh, um, for, for an invasive search or reasonable suspicion for stop and frisk, uh, you know, and you have to articulate. So it has to be reasonable, articulable suspicion. And you cannot say it can't be race. It can't be. It can't be. You know, it can it can be based on race. For instance, if the race of the individual you're stopping matches the race of the suspect, uh, um, uh, you know. But by hypothesis, we are looking at a situation where the suspect, the robbery suspect, was white as well, right? Um, so so in terms of articulable suspicion, right? Uh, we are saying that if you had the same level of articulable suspicion in these cases, can a jury... So my question is really, does the jury disagree with Mark Dayton and Peter Moskos and think that this person would have been killed if he were white? Or do they agree and don't consider that to be sufficient uh, in order to find the officer guilty? That's. I think we should ask them. And not only them, I think there's a very good academic study here. Um, I, I read a book some time ago that really had a big impact on me called Jurors' Stories of Death. Mm. Jurors' Stories of Death. And the author's name will occur to me. Uh, I could look it up right now, but I don't want to take the time to do that. Yeah. Uh, but anyone who's interested could find this book and the author, um, who's a, a sociologist, trained at Northeastern University in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, what he did was he interviewed... Um, hundreds of uh, death penalty jurors mm -hmm. and just had them narrate what was their reasoning in uh, the particular case in which they had served as jurors in coming to the conclusion of voting uh, as they did vote, uh, usually affirmatively in capital cases for the death penalty. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very enlightening experience to, to read this book because what he... Um, Gosh, I almost thought of his name. What he discovers is that many of the jurors have first to tell themselves stories about the defendant that puts the defendant outside of the uh, orbit of kind of human decency. You know, they have to construct in their minds the person who's mm -hmm. been convicted now. He's been convicted of murder. And we're at the punishment phase, and the jury is deliberating on whether the penalty should be death or whatever and hearing witnesses on that. Um, and uh, they, they have to somehow come to the conclusion that this is a person beneath contempt, a person whose humanity is suspect, a, a, a person who was monstrous. And once having so right. perceived the defendant, it then becomes possible or maybe even necessary to kill him. Um, and some of the bases, th this is anecdotal now, this is all anecdotal, some of the bases upon which jurors reach this uh, uh, conclusion about the humanity of the defendant are as flimsy as they could possibly be. So in one case, yeah. the defendant's mother comes into the courtroom to testify on behalf of her child. Please don't kill my son. He did something terrible, but he's not a terrible person. Don't kill him. Life in prison should be enough. She comes to testify. The defendant doesn't look at his mother, according to the report, when she comes into the courtroom. One of the jurors says, what kind of guy wouldn't even look at his mother? What kind of person, what kind of, he has no conscience whatsoever. He wouldn't even look his mother in the eye when she came into the courtroom to beg for his life. And I thought when I read that, well, my God, the juror has no idea what the relationship between this man and his mother might have been. 
has no idea what neglect or abuse the mother might have subjected him to. I don't know that she did. I don't know that she didn't. And neither does the juror. The juror is searching, it seemed to me, for a reason to so uh, conclude. Anyway, I go on too long about this. I, I simply want to say that um, I would love to know what jurors in cases of this kind have to say to each other. After the case has been decided, they can be uh, providing their information anonymously. I'm not saying that you know we need to open up and uh, embarrass people and, uh, and all like that. But, but I, I, I really want to know something about the, the, the psychodynamics of jury deliberations in cases like this. There were black people on that jury. I, I mean, many questions arise. If the jury had been all white, of course, the verdict would have been perceived widely as illegitimate. Does it matter that there were black people on the jury and that they came to this conclusion? I mean, this is another kind of racial profiling question, isn't it? Is a juror's race relevant to their capacity to carry forward a, a deliberation? Should our willingness to accept the jury's outcome depend upon the racial composition of the jury and so on? I mean, yeah. <laughs> these, are, these are questions we have. Without easy, without easy answers, uh, intuitively it seems as if yes, the presence of two African Americans in the jury adds legitimacy to the verdict. Um, delving deeper into exactly delving deeper into exactly why or what they went through, um, yeah, that's that, that's harder. This it's a very tough case, you know. It's it's I mean, I mean, of course, we as viewers we can be saddened by it and exhausted in some sense by it, but you know, of course, the, the uh, you know, Reynolds and and her daughter and Fernando Castillo, you know, went through, went through an unspeakable horror. He said here loud and clear, Philando Castile was no thug. Not at all. Not Philando at all. Castile, by all accounts, uh, yeah. was a good and decent human being. Uh, and whose uh, loss of life was an absolute travesty, if not a crime. Uh, and the fact that he was black, uh, and the fact that uh, they were smoking marijuana in his car, and the fact that they might like to listen to rap music, and the fact that he, hadn't, he wasn't married to uh, the woman with whom he had been living for 10 years, uh, and the fact that he uh, might have spoken the English with a certain uh, uh, black English, spoken the language with a certain black English inflection, have no bearing whatsoever upon his decency or upon his humanity. Um, and uh, we mustn't lose track of the humanity of people who find themselves trapped uh, in uh, this kind of a situation. Yeah, to me, actually, I would go even further. I, to me, he's a, he was a man of uncommon decency, extraordinary generosity. Um, you know, really, uh, really, really hard to imagine. I, I mean, I find it quite hard to imagine, to tell you the truth, that if you know, if I was involved with somebody for 10 years and they had a child during an interruption of that relationship, uh, with a man, and, and, and then, uh, you know, for me to take that child and as my own, to read to her, to facilitate, uh, uh, you know, the, the um, my partner's ability to, to, to keep and hold these two jobs, which it seems to me were difficult jobs, not, but not especially rewarding jobs. Um, and then, you know, he, by all accounts, he was, he was very much liked in his workplace. Um, the whole picture that emerges of Castile from this interview and from, from other sources is of a man of uncommon decency, I, I would say. I, I, that's, that's, that, I was just struck by that, um, no matter how credible one, one thinks of Diamond Reynolds as a witness, and, and to me she seemed extremely credible, but, but her character is not really relevant to our evaluation of him. It, it's, um, yeah, I, I, just, I just think he's exceptional. That's a final observation. Uh, I wonder if you picked up on this. Our guys from Central Casting, that was uh, the uh, salt and pepper uh, police officer team who were doing the interrogation. At one point, yeah. report to her that he is probably not going to make it. I don't remember the exact words that they use, yeah. but his condition is referred to. They have information about it, and uh, it is yeah. it is grave. He's he's not going to make it. So they tell yeah. her this, and she has this uh, outburst of grief in which she wails. Yeah. And yeah, again, yeah. like yeah. I say, if you were trying to do a stage play or a movie of something like this. You couldn't do better than create the scene 
uh, which is at that moment, because these guys don't know what to say to her at that moment. And a long time goes by, as I recall, before anybody says, I'm sorry right. to her. Right. Uh, it, was, it, it, it actually made me a little bit uncomfortable that they seemed unable to comfort her, not that she would have necessarily accepted any comfort from them, but um, I, I, I was there sitting, waiting. Who is, when is somebody going to say, oh, my God, I'm so sorry? Yeah, that's right. I, in fact, my recollection is that, is that they tell her that he has, in fact, died. Um, uh, and and she she wails for yeah she she she's just yeah yeah and she just wails and there's a there's a lot of silence and then after the silence after some uh, you know after the moment has passed then they step back into the routine right it's it's you know the interrogation continues yeah and and, and they go back to you know, okay, can you describe the events one more time? You know, it's, it's, it is. Moments yeah. to, you know, gather yourself or can we get you something or whatever. Yeah, 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 that's another very remarkable feature of this. I, I hope that the viewers of your show will just take the time. It's time to watch it. It's about, uh, I think, 35 minutes or so long. Um, but it's, it's, it's riveting, like I said. It's, yeah, I couldn't take my eyes off it. Thanks very much, Raji, for uh, just giving us some time and talking about this uh, at the Glenn Show. I really appreciate it, friend. My pleasure. My pleasure, Glenn. Okay.